Today, most evangelical Christians are making a sad mistake. If you haven't found this out yet, you need to find it out over the next few weeks as we look at some of the issues and teachings that Paul will set forth concerning the Holy Spirit. You cannot live a Christian life without being filled with the Holy Spirit. let say it again. You cannot live a Christian life without being filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. For that reason, these messages, I hope, will bring great encouragement to you, but also inspiration and motivation for you to rethink, meditate upon, consider in your life personally the great ministry of the Holy Spirit. We began by looking at a verse in Ephesians 3rd chapter. Verses 1 through 5 arrest our attention, but particularly the 5th verse has a concluding thought. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace, of God which has been given unto me toward you. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Fifth verse. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed and to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That verse tells you something very wonderful. That we are living in a day and time of great enlightenment by the Spirit. Did you hear what I said? Dear child of God, do not treat this too lightly. In ages past, men and women did not have the privilege of the great, great enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. But thank God today, we do. Amen. From Pentecost till this very hour, we are living in a wonderful period and age in which the Spirit of God has been working mightily upon the sons and daughters of men. Prophesied in Joel of a great outpouring of the Spirit of God upon all flesh. And it has come, and it has happened. We are living in the time of great revelation today. The reason you have this blessed book is because we are living in that time of revelation. Amen. Folks, without that special time, we would still be in darkness even as past generations before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of living during this age, when the Holy Spirit is actively revealing great and mighty spiritual truths to all men. In the past, only a few were privileged to know the great spiritual truths, like certain leaders, certain kings, and certain prophets. But no longer... The great truths of heaven and eternal truths are now open to all men because of this great ministry of the Holy Spirit. You are not restricted in any way, shape, or form to the knowledge that is available to you through the work and the ministry and the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Think about it. You know as much about God today as you want to know. Amen. You have the blessed revelation of the Word of God. And you have available to you the great and mighty, enlightening, revealing work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit has at work mightily in our world. You stop and give consideration to this. I want this to become deeply embedded in your heart for a reason. 
The Holy Spirit is responsible for every soul that has ever been saved. Did you hear what I said? The Holy Spirit is responsible for every soul that has been saved. Since Jesus declared it is finished on the cross, the Holy Spirit has been involved in every, every salvation experience. Not one soul from that moment till this day has found faith in Christ or been forgiven of sin or become a child of God or experienced regeneration or known the adoption into the family of God without the enlightenment and revealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not one. Not one. His ministry has been for generation after generation after generation. From that day till now, over 2,000 years, His work has been accomplished in the hearts of men and women just like you and I. His work from Pentecost until this very hour, in fact, until His ministry is completed. This is the greatest work that mankind has ever known. This great enlightening ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want you to stop and think about it. I want you to ponder it well and consider it deeply. Dwell upon it till it drives you to your knees. We are living in a blessed time. Amen. A blessed time. When the Spirit of God is moving all across this globe of ours. Bringing understanding and enlightenment and comprehension to the hearts and minds of men and women. Regardless of the age, the period, the time of human history, from its darkest ages and periods to this hour of modern technology, the Holy Spirit is still revealing Christ and the gospel of redemption to the hearts of men and women like yours and mine. Amen. He alone brings revelation and enlightenment, spiritual comprehension. He has opened the eyes and understanding of the hearts of men and women in every age, across every boundary, in every culture. He has worked and He is working even now. Amen. One day, thank God, He graciously opened my eyes to the realities of Christ. I heard things I had never heard before. I understood things I could not understand before. The darkness left my heart and soul, and the light of Jesus Christ flooded me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, had opened my understanding and gave me enlightenment. That's His work. That's His ministry. Praise God, He's still at work right now. Today. My friend, do not spurn His pleading and His work with you. The Spirit of God has been leading you to that place to where you need to openly and consciously and publicly acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life then do not spurn that enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. It's a blessed thing. It is a blessed thing. We are living in a blessed time. Before this day is over, I want you to think with me. Before this day is over, thousands will be brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit as at work bringing enlightenment to their hearts and their minds through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. In every continent of this world today, there will be people embracing Christ as Savior and Lord. There is work being done in places that we don't even know about. The Spirit of God as a work, a mighty, mighty work of revelation that He has achieved. Jesus said of him in John the 14th chapter, He said it's necessary that He comes. 
He says, I've got to go away. I've got some things I've got to do. And it's necessary that He comes. Because if He comes, He is going to lead men into all truth. And He will take the things that are mine, and He will show them unto you. <clears throat> Only the Holy Spirit can open the heart of a person, the mind of a person, <clears throat> to the eternal realities of the truth that is in Christ Jesus. It is a precious day in which we are living. A day in which this mighty, precious, revealing work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> is being accomplished. Friends, how we need to recognize this. My words, my preaching, your testimony, none of it can open the hearts of men. None of it can break through to bring the understanding that needs to be brought. There is only one who can do that. And that is the precious Spirit of God. Who brings forth that work which only He has been given to do. To bring truth, understanding, and enlightenment of spiritual realities to the hearts of men and women like you and I. How we need to recognize His presence. Amen? How we need to acknowledge His ministry among us. And oh, how we need to appreciate this great revealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you read your Word of God. I don't know what you say. But when I get into the Word of God, whether it be a memorized portion I have, or a new portion I'm working on, or just a portion I'm reading. I always recognize that I need my eyes to be open. I need to see what is there in the Word of God, not with my mind, not with my intelligence, but with that mighty enlightening work of the Holy Spirit, whereby He imparts truth to my heart, and it burns within me, and it comes to me, with an authority because the Spirit of God is bringing it forth alive and vital in my soul. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank God for this great work that Paul mentions here in this text about the mighty work of enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and the period of that enlightenment that we now live under. But that's not all he teaches us about the Holy Spirit. There is much more in the book of Ephesians, which you should have been contemplating by now. <clears throat> in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, he has some more to say about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to spell a word for you. <clears throat> I was going to do it... <clears throat> So I'm going to give you uh, the letters to this word right now. <clears throat> you ready? Write it down. P, B, P, G, I, N, F, W, M, Y. One more time. P B P G I N F W M Y. Now, if anybody can pronounce that, <clears throat> you can do a lot better than I'm doing, I tell you that. But that is important to the text we read right now, which is in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. <clears throat> Verses 11 and 12. Everybody there? <clears throat> and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. 
Three things are set forth there that we need to think about very briefly. The work of the Holy Spirit involves the perfecting of the saints, the work of ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. The perfecting of the saints. First of all, let's talk about the word saint. That word is used to describe in the Scriptures all who are partakers of salvation in Christ Jesus. If you have received the salvation in Christ, you are a saint. A saint is not a special group of people that have reached a certain level of development, whereby somebody recognizes that they are a cut above everybody else, and they have arrived at a status whereby we declare that they have reached sainthood. If you are a child of God today, the Bible says you are a saint. Amen. Amen. The term saint refers to all those who have been declared righteous by God because of their faith in the work of Christ in their behalf. If you by faith have come to the understanding that Jesus Christ has provided for you that righteousness which cannot be made by human hands, that righteousness which God will accept. And by faith you receive that righteousness. The Word of God says, you are a saint. Now, our text says that saints have to be perfected. They haven't reached perfection. They are in the process of being perfected. Amen. <clears throat> That's that word I gave you. It's running out of word. It stands for a lot of words. So follow. P B P G I N F W M Y stands for this. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Amen. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Mike and I, Bertha, Renette, several others, and some of you have covered some of that material, but early on we attended a conference that had a button about that big with those letters on it. And during this conference that was about four days in length, including all weekend, we were privileged to have some time to break for lunch, and we would go in the streets of Long Beach and find restaurants and sit down, and we all had these buttons on. We got the strangest remarks about those buttons. They were just those letters strung out and people would come up and try to pronounce it. They would come up and say, what in the world is that? Which gave us the opportunity to say, we had this vividly demonstrated to us through a visual. I'm not an artist. I wouldn't even attempt it. But the visual was that God started making you, informing you, and He put you on an easel and He began forming your life in your circumstances, in your situation. At some point in time, you got down off of that easel and you began to draw the picture you wanted to draw. And the picture you wanted to draw was not the picture that God wanted to draw. Uh, Are are you visualizing this? And this wonderful little artist was drawing this picture. 
And it was a beautiful scene. And I thought, man, I'd like to have that. But then when he got this scene finished, I remember it as a beautiful hill country with a great lake and all sorts of things, just gorgeous around it that he drew. And he did it quite quickly. You've seen Chalk Talks. With the lights and everything, it's just sometimes can be quite spectacular. And he got it, and I thought, man, that's beautiful. That's just wonderful. But then he took a black crayon, and he went all over that thing and just messed it up. Huh? Well, that's what a lot of us have done. Amen? Amen. Huh? That which God started in our lives, we've just scarred it tremendously. We've just brought into ourselves and to others things that have just been devastating. And it looks like the picture has been ruined. That sinks in for a moment and then this man begins taking all of those marks and making out of them even more beauty. And showing that if we would get back on the easel, that God could even take the devastating things that we've done and He could make beauty out of them and He could give beauty for ashes. Amen? Amen. He can do it. So, please be patient. God is not finished with us yet. The work of the Holy Spirit is in this work of perfecting the saints. The word perfecting is a Greek word, katartesis. It means a process of change and transformation leading to a finished state of completion. The Holy Spirit is at work in your life, my friend. And He has an ultimate goal in mind. He has an ultimate purpose to achieve in you. He is working towards perfecting you. And that goal is clearly stated in Ephesians 4, verse 13. God will work in you till we come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a what? You read it. A perfect man. Amen. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is the blueprint. Christ is the prototype. Christ is that which God is going to conform you to, His image. And He will not stop short of that. Amen? Amen. He won't do it. (laughs) You may be happy and contented to be half, but God is not contented and happy for you to be half. God's plan for you as a child of God is to reach the measure of the full stature of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He is perfecting the saints. The Holy Spirit is involved in this work, and He is involved in the work of empowering us for ministry. The challenges facing the Christian church today are daunting. In fact, I hear frequently from fellow pastors and from books that I read of how challenging this hour is for the Christian church. We are having, it seems, to face issues that no other church has ever had to face. We're having to deal with circumstances and situations that seem to be far greater than those of past ages. I'm afraid there have been times when I have fallen into that way of thinking myself. 
but it's not true. There is nothing new under the face of the sun. It is true that we must minister a broken and fractured and fallen world. It is true that we have great and massive problems to deal with in our world. But we have exactly what our world needs. And that is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. If the gospel of Jesus Christ brought the Roman Empire to its knees, then it can bring America to its knees. Amen. Acts 1.8 declares something that you should be able to quote. It simply says this, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witness unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> what is it that enables us to minister to our world? Our knowledge? No. no. Our cleverness? No. Our best conceived programs? No. Our entertaining ways? No. Our contemporary programs? No. no. One thing and one thing only. What? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He and He alone can enable us to meet the tremendous, tremendous problems, situation, and circumstances that are present in our society. But I believe with all my heart that the gospel of Jesus Christ is exactly what this nation needs. I believe it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that led to our foundation. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. I don't care what Professor Flute Snoot says. I believe with all my heart that it was the great principles of the gospel that led men and women to a foreign land to establish a new place where they could worship God in freedom according to the own convictions of their own hearts. And those convictions were formulated upon the Word of God. Today, I'm going to say it bluntly, if America returns to God, it's going to be because of two factors that I can see. Number one, God's sovereign mercy and grace would just be extended just like He did to Nineveh. God spared a mighty culture in Nineveh. Because God chose to do so. If this land is to know once again the blessing of God upon it, it will either be because of God's sovereign grace moving because God mercifully chooses to do so. But another source would be the pulpits of America. If the pulpits of America would return to the gospel of Jesus Christ and proclaim it clearly and precisely and completely without any hesitation, without any excuses, not making any kind of reservation, but preaching the word instant in season and out of season 
we could see a turn of this nation, but it would have to come from our pulpits. And your lives. The day has come when we need to speak truth and speak it bluntly, forwardly. <clears throat> what was sin when this book was written by the Holy Spirit is still sin today. Amen. 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 <laughs> I don't care what's being taught by certain people. Things have not changed. Man's heart is still the same. And man still needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He empowers us for our work of ministry. <clears throat> and He is involved in the edifying of the body of Christ. This word edify appears throughout our scriptures over and over again. It's actually a word of construction, of building. To edify means to build. It speaks of the act of building. The erection of an edifice. The Holy Spirit is building and erecting and producing an accomplishment, the construction of something wonderful. The body of Christ. The church. The called out ones. The bride. The eternal Companion of the Son in Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Turn. 18 through 22. For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now... Therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, and in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is building the body of Christ. <clears throat> this day and time, in fact, <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that when Bertha and I returned, our phone was not filled with messages. Thank you for giving us some time. We enjoyed it greatly and couldn't have been... More delightful. And God blessed us greatly in many ways. And so thank you. But I did receive a couple of calls. Fortunately, this was not from someone who is highly connected with our fellowship, but has attended on occasion. In the process of our conversation, this was mentioned. You know, I've decided, it's been through the years that as I've gotten involved in churches, I've, I've been discouraged, I've been disappointed, I've been misunderstood, I've been hurt. Things didn't go the way they should have gone, and I, <clears throat> I've decided that it's just going to be me and the Lord for now. It's me and the Lord. I'll fellowship with Him, but I'm not, I'm not going to get involved with any kind of fellowship of believers ever again. I'm just not going to do it. Since I had this sermon formulated in my heart and been stewing with it, I had to say that's impossible. What? That's impossible. You say, what do you mean it's impossible? You cannot, listen to me, be in right standing with Christ and out of fellowship with His body. You can't do it. I'm going to say it again. You cannot be 
in right standing with Christ and out of fellowship with his body. It is absolutely impossible. <clears throat> that is a fallacy that many folks have chosen for their own comfort and their own reasons. My scripture says that we are being builded together into a holy habitation of God in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> this is the great work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. One more text I want you to look at briefly in Ephesians 5. Yet Paul calls more attention <clears throat> to this great ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. Verses 8 and 9 of the 5th chapter. <clears throat> what does it say? For ye were sometimes darkness. Is that true, brothers? But now are ye light in the Lord. Amen? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. What will the Holy Spirit produce in your life? All goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's what He'll do. That's what He'll accomplish in you. That's what He'll produce in you. Goodness, righteousness, Truth. Listen quickly. Goodness here is not the goodness of men. Goodness here is the goodness of God. Do you remember that time in Matthew when a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said to him, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There is only one good, and that's God. Well, of course, we recognize that Jesus was saying that to him so that he would acknowledge the fact of the divinity of Christ himself. But when we talk about goodness, we're talking about God's goodness, not man's goodness. And Jesus himself said there is only one source of true goodness, and it is God. Amen? Amen. Huh? Amen? Amen. <laughs> and if you are going to be a person who ultimately does the goodness of God, it will be because the Holy Spirit does a mighty work in your heart and life that enables you to do what man cannot do in and of himself. Men can be good to those who are good to them. Is that not true? Huh? <laughs> Men can be good as long as there is something in it for them. Is that not true? <clears throat> Men can be good to a degree as long as it is not too costly. But that's not the goodness of God. If you're going to know the goodness of God, it goes well beyond the ability of man. The goodness of God is full of mercy. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This matter of God's goodness must be produced in our hearts by that deep, deep work of the Holy Spirit and He must of necessity perform holy surgery to get this done in us. Amen. Where does such goodness come from that I would only speak those things which lift up, encourage, elevate, and enable others to receive the grace of God? Such goodness can only come from God Himself. This kind of goodness goes the extra mile. This kind of goodness turns the other cheek. This kind of goodness 
has removed all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking with all malice from its existence. Goodness of God. Let us do good unto all men. And that goodness is not my definition of goodness. It is the goodness of God. The Holy Spirit will produce that in me. He will produce righteousness. There are two kinds of righteousness in the Word of God. That imputed righteousness, which is the righteousness of Christ, which becomes ours by faith. Imputed righteousness. Whereby we stand by our faith in Christ, clothed in the very righteousness of Christ, and God declares us fully righteous as Christ. Amen. Now, brother, that's the book of Romans. <clears throat> but there is another form of righteousness, and it is spoken of in the fifth chapter here. We look at it briefly. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. That's a practical righteousness, folks. Huh? Be ye followers of God. Right? As dear children. Read the next verse. Walk in love. As Christ also loved us. And hath given Himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God a sweet smell and savor. That's a practical righteousness. That has to do with your life and your conduct. Can you walk that way? Only by one source, the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God can enable you to walk in that manner. His ministry will establish us in a life of goodness, a life of righteousness, and a life of truth. <clears throat> There's much more in Ephesians about the Holy Spirit. Our next lesson will tell us that it is absolutely necessary that we be filled with the Spirit of God. <clears throat> so what our next lesson will be will be a very practical lesson. What is this matter of the filling of the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> First of all, it is God's will that you be filled with His Spirit. Be not ye unwise, but be ye understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be filled with His Spirit. Amen. Now today, there is much confusion about this issue. So we want to clarify this for you. We're going to look at what the filling of the Holy Spirit is not. What it is not. There is much that has been spoken that is misleading regarding it. Then we're going to look at what the filling of the Holy Spirit is. What it is not, what it is. And then the third part of our next message will be how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, I've just given you several reasons. He is the Spirit of Revelation, and without His ministry in your life, you cannot know the Word of God. Amen. You can't do it. You can go to every college and every seminary in the world and there are many people who have had and they don't understand the least thing about the Word of God. They can give you facts and information about it, but the Word of God has never penetrated their heart and it bears no fruit in them whatsoever. <clears throat> you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because His work is to perfect you. His work is to empower you for ministry. 
His work is to make you a part of the body of Christ. To give you a place in it and a ministry in it. And His work, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, will bring you into a life of true goodness of God. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. Amen. <clears throat> We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because of this goodness. And we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because of the other two matters. One being <clears throat> righteousness. If I'm going to live correctly, I need a power that is far greater than me. I need something that is far beyond my abilities and my resources, my skills. I need a power that can enable me to live against all that hell might throw at me. I need a power that's greater <clears throat> than the power of positive thinking. Amen. I need a power that's greater than anything that men can generate. I need the power of God's Spirit in my life enabling me <clears throat> to live a life of righteousness. And I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order that I might live truth, speak truth, and demonstrate truth in all of my life. I trust you'll be present. We come to the conclusion of our message this morning. I'm going to sing, I believe, just as I am.